Welcome back. You're still watching Money Live on SABC2. We're live from Uncle Tom Community Hall in Orlando West in Soweto. The discussion is uh, mainly around the 16th June 1976. Tomorrow will be the 40th anniversary of the events of the day. Remember, I said that at home you can also share with us uh, your memories of the day or what you know, what you've learned, or what you've had, because we've had quite a very informative session here so far this morning. Conversation coming from those who were there, you know, narrating the story better to bring a better understanding to us here at watching Morning Live. So we're quickly going to go to the floor to the members of the public who have questions to the member of the panel here this morning. Kolani Masemula. Okay, uh, my name is Kolani Masemula. I'm from Steve Chet, a local municipality which is led by the Honorable Mike Stula Somkonto Masina, also a member of the Youth Chamber of Commerce and Industries in Pumalang. My question is directed to the panel as a whole. As the, the generation of 76 has a, a, had a, a collective a mission on achieving political freedom, how would you advise the current generation of 2016 to achieve a collective a mission of economic freedom? I thank you. What are your observations, Kolani, if I may ask? The current observation is that the, youth, the current youth is eager to attain economic freedom, just that we don't know in, in, on how should we do it as a collective, because we're doing it in silos, and that is really not moving us forward. Okay, no, thank you very much. Let's get another question from Hope Mariri. Hi, my name is Hope Mariri and I'm from Love Life under Steve Church local municipality. My, my question is based on the panel. I want to know that in some of the schools, we, we, we still have the Africans as an additional language. So like in lower grades, the students are still, they still use Africans as an additional language, so they are not given a choice to choose if whether they want to do Africans or not. So I want to know, like, are we somehow forced to, to, to use Africans as an additional language and why those students are not given like a choice to choose if they want to do it or not? Okay, if I can just get clarity, are they doing a third language? What, what you sorry? Say? Are they doing Africans third language? They have their home language, English, and then Africans. Is that yes, what you're saying? Yes, okay, yes. All right. No, I needed clarity on that. Okay, okay Dr. Mulefi, would you like to respond to the first question? I think the issue of unity I posted to you earlier. The, the question of uh, economic freedom. Well, the first point, and, and that is Chaba made to this point, that apartheid was intended to stunt the academic or intellectual development of the black youth in this country, so that they remain subservient to the white masters. The fight against the apartheid education and Africans as an imposition 1976 and ultimately heralding the DA deracialized education as we see in the country was intended to open opportunities for creativity and the realization of the talent that every youth in South Africa is free. And the, therefore, the, base, the education providing a basis for independence of the mind and for the independence of innovation amongst our people. That being the case would therefore enable the young people in our country to become entrepreneurs, uh, to become uh, uh, innovators, uh, to set up their own companies, and to attain that economic freedom, to earn a living better than if you were not allowed to acquire the highest level of academic qualification in society. Um, of course, within the same context, therefore, you also have the government policies that pertains to the transformation of the economy, black economy, broad-based black economic empowerment, the emphasis on the marginalized group who would include the youth, the women, people living with disability, and the military veterans, who, amongst whom are mainly those who were in the June 16 uh, generation. 
because they served in the army. They are back now. They are, uh, we are now in our 60s. Um, therefore, government, through its policies, is deliberately ensuring that there is participation by those people. The biggest challenge to all of us is to take the initiative. Nobody is going to pull you by the hand and uh, feed you. But are the young people in South Africa taking, you know, uh, making use of the opportunities that they have? I think many of them are uh, taking uh, the, making use of the opportunities they have. But clearly we need programs to, uh, to galvanize them into taking even greater opportunities. And the National Youth Development Agency is a mechanism created by the government to, to galvanize the youth to, and to inspire them to participate in processes that would lead to economic freedom. Okay, but I think mainly Kolani's concern was that uh, back in 1976, the young people were united in attaining uh, freedom in, in, in education, but now economic freedom, it looks like they're working in silos. Yeah, p p part of the difficulty is that, uh, of course, there we were fighting a political uh, struggle. Uh, there was a strong basis for solidarity amongst uh, both youth and parents. Okay. In a capitalist society, unfortunately, unfortunately, you end up with a situation where those who work hard progress, those who don't work hard do not. Uh, so that is why government will continue to encourage the youth through these various mechanisms mm -hmm. to participate. But ultimately, it is incumbent upon the youth themselves They've got to, to check up themselves up. Some people came before them. They created an environment, an, an enabling environment for them to flourish. Okay. Uh, they've got to do it. They've got to take advantage of that. All right. Now, luckily, here in the hall, we have the MEC of Education in Gauteng, Panyaza Lesofi. MEC, I'm just going to take this opportunity to let you answer uh, what Hope was asking Africans as an additional language. I, I really appreciate. Uh, <coughs> Maybe there are a few things that I need to clarify first. Uh, the first part is that uh, we've got 11 official languages within the education space. We have added uh, sign languages, the 12 official language. And all those languages are easily available to everyone uh, to choose. And the right to choose a language in a certain school lies with parents. We believe that parents have the responsibility to determine a language policy to say this is the language we believe uh, will be in a position will be in a position to utilize within our schooling environment. The reason we are doing that is because uh, you know apartheid planning was terrible. Uh, you had a school for Kosas only, Zulus only, Pedis only, and all those languages, and it limited it limited access. You find that closer to you, you only have a school that uh, admit Pedis speaking or uh, Pedis speaking people. You have to pass that school to go to many other schools. So the need to integrate uh, languages was very, very important. So Afrikaans is one of those official languages, and parents can choose uh, within that schooling environment whether they need that language now as an additional language. But what is very, very important, which is the agenda that we have brought uh, 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 as this government, is that uh, from next year, all our grade ones in Gauteng, all of them without exception, including former Model C schools, all of them it will be compulsory for them to take one African language uh, as a subject. Uh, because social cohesion is very important. You can't have a, a child when you have to speak to Makoko, somebody must interpret what the child is saying to Makoko. Uh, uh, and it's the difficulty that we find ourselves in. Uh, and, and if we can't improve that, we'll have a serious problem. So language is very, very important. And, and we need to defend it, we need to promote it, and we need to ensure that it's accessible. That is why even the Constitutional Court has empowered us as a department that there must be no single school where people believe they can speak one single language alone. Uh, that everyone must be welcomed and the schools but, but must the be fact, open. If I can them. just come in there, MEC, the yeah. fact that uh, you're saying that from grade one all learners will be, you know, bound, if I can use that way, to, to, to take one of the African languages, is it not what the 1976 class fought for? Because they fought, they did not want to be taught in Africans. So it, it sounds as if, you know, you you imposing on the uh, students to also take one African language as, 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 you know, as a subject. 
Well, the difference here is choice. Uh, so we didn't have choice in 1976. It was imposed. Now you have choice. You'll meet as parents and say, within this economic space, we believe so to an appropriate language so that our children can. I mean, they're in other provinces. It's not even difficult. For, it's not going to be a difficult issue. You go to the Eastern Cape, surely there, Tosa is the dominant language. So you will have parents that will choose that. Let's uh, uh, learn. It's just that in Gauteng, it's difficult because we've got all languages here. And people have to make that particular choice. But the struggle of June 2016, it was beyond language. Yes, language triggered all the issues. It's about quality education. It was access to education and the benefits within the education space. If you check the apartheid system at that time, the amount of money they were spending on a white child and the amount of money they were spending on the black child, the gap was huge. As I'm speaking to you now, we are spending more money on an African child than any other child, purely because we are rectifying the mistakes that we had in June 16. So, the struggle of June 16 was not merely about language. Uh, it went beyond language. Yes, language triggered it. But as everyone that is there in your panel has explained, you know, it was for us to access opportunities, for us, for us to be free. It was for us to have this political freedom that would allow our people to be free and to have quality education. We've made progress in terms of quality education, and me and you will agree. There are still limitations and still gaps. Uh, 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 if you check, a performance within our uh, township schools compared to performance to other schools, you will see that we still have a challenge. There are sparks of brilliancy there, but limitations are still there, and we need to fix uh, those limitations. But, but I, I can assure you, quality education will happen in our lifetime. Okay, so there is light at the end of the time. Definitely, uh, definitely. No, thank you very much to Gauteng Education MBC, Panyaza Sufi. Let's go back to the floor. Like I said earlier on, you know, it's all about interacting with the people on the ground just to hear their views and the memories of the day at home. Hashtag TNA is We'll be taking a look at your tweets later here on the show. Charles Makua. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I hear Untate uh, Popomulife says that uh, the youth now has, we have to check ourselves up. Does it mean that because in 1976 they checked themselves up to fight uh, the pol political oppression that they're facing, now do we have to check us ourselves up to fight the economic uh, struggle that we're facing? But that is just the question that I'm posing. Uh, generally what, what do I you think as a, young, as a young person? Do you think that we need to do that? We need to check ourselves up? Well, we, we have to, but it is going to be difficult. Uh, before me, I, I, I can answer your question is that uh, coming from the municipality that we come from, which is Steve Chwete, the local municipality, we, we, we are led uh, by leaders who understand our cries as young people. Uh, pardon us also if we will sound as if we are, we are here to praise our leadership, but we have to give credit where it's is true. We are equally giving credit to the youth of 1976 that fought uh, for, 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 for political freedom. And ourselves, where we're coming from, we, 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 are, we are coming from a municipality where there's an unemployment rate of 19.7%. And because of the leadership that we have, led by uh, Councillor Mike Massina, who's doing very well by understanding our issues as young people, that it is not only government only that can, can address these issues, but it is a partnership between private and public sector coming together to, to, to address our issues. Okay. And we believe that by, by so doing, a lot will be achieved. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much, Charles. And Dr. No, I agree. I agree with Charles that uh, we, we, we have to use a, a, a hybrid or combination of mechanisms to assist the youth uh, to attain empowerment. But I like the message that comes through that says, uh, and it comes in the form of a question, does it mean we should fight uh, to attain that freedom? Yes, we have to do so. But what does the fight mean? Mm. The fight means each one taking the initiative, each one demonstrating discipline and determination to move forward, each one getting organized, each one taking the advantage of institutions that teach entrepreneurship, but uh, simultaneously each one studying policies, programs of the government, and challenging those who are running institutions, um, uh, state institutions that are supposed to be the drivers 
uh, and the implementers of uh, these programs to actually do so. Uh, so it is important that we do so. We need that collaboration from our side where we are sitting in state entities. We would enforce those policies from anybody who wants to do work um, with a state entity, that they must demonstrate what they are doing for the youth, what they are doing for women, for people living with disabilities and the military veterans. That's one way of ensuring that we correct uh, this, the imbalances of the past that uh, MEC Panyasa Lusuvi was talking about albeit in the context of education, but it, it straddles uh, all aspects of life. Okay, now <coughs> let's just quickly go back to the floor. We're going to Marcus Massimo. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is indicated is Marcus Masemola. I am the youth manager of Steve Chuet local municipality. So we only have a... As, as Steve Chuet, local municipality. Yes, we are leading yes. as Steve Chuet, local municipality. I and I think the MEC also take note that as young people, we are leading there. Uh. But I think my question is to the panel there. But first of all, let us appreciate the life and the blood that was shed by our fallen heroes and our young people in 1976. We want to appreciate that. It's a very, very a painful thing to hear what they went through. But of course, as the youth of today, my question is that, as a word of advice, how can we get our own government to listen to our own frustration as young people? Today, we are faced with the high rate of substance abuse amongst our youth, the high rate of teenage pregnancy, the high rate of, of crime, and the high rate of unemployment. That is why as young people, we normally say, there's nothing about us without us. But seeming our government is missing a point because we are here, we want to raise our issues. At some point, we attended consultative workshops where in terms of the national youth policy, we discussed it. But some of the issues didn't reflect on that particular policies. And I'm happy the way also, as Mr. Popo was just uh, raising that, the police at that time had a very critical role that they are playing, though in a wrong way. But how also that can our government hear our cry we don't want to fight we don't want to go to the streets but really we feel that our government needs now to pay serious attention and addressing issues of young people i'll make one example the nyda yes is there it's assisting us we support it but let us be honest that can we have an act that says directly what should happen in terms of youth development in the entire south africa because you go to government departments, they'll tell you it's not our competence. Youth development is not our competence. You go to local government, it's not our competence. Who is going to be the competence uh, in terms of issues of youth development? Hence, I'm saying, what are we supposed to do as the youth of South Africa to make our voice heard as the youth of today, especially to our own government? Uh, our own government. All right, Marcus, thank you very much. Thank you very much. PT, we do not have government represented here today because we, we're basically reflecting back mainly on the events of uh, 1976 on June 16th, but pointing taken. Thank you very much. Deboho Machuhe. Um, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Deboho. Fortunately, I don't come from. Uh, Steve Chetham is pilot. But you know what the fortunate part is? Yeah. You're from the NYDA, so yes, you can be uh, able to respond to what Marcus was saying. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely respond from, from what he says. Um, from our side as NYDA, I will just make a, a, a simple example in trying to answer the question that has been put forward. We were tasked to go and look for 50 young people in, in the Malathlian municipality in Pumalanga because of the program from the National Department of Health ran by uh, Deputy Minister Mr. Joe Pal, because he visited last year the area and he went door to door campaign and he was disturbed by the sketch of poverty that side. So he came to our office and said, No, look, guys, go and look for 50 young people from that side, give them training, give them funding, so that as I come in 2016, I want to see them as beneficiaries. I'll be frank with you. Yes, young people are disorganized, they work in silos. We managed to get some of them. But of course, as in when we started to give them training, some of them pulled out of the program. 
So in a nutshell, probably my answer to Marcus is that I think what Colina said earlier, we need a good advice from our former leaders, from the panel up there, as to how can they assist to collectively unite us so that as in when these programs come to us, they can find us standing so that we can be able to be freed from this uh, poverty that is we are facing. Because as in when these opportunities come, we always find ourselves pulling out because we want something that is quick, quick, something that will give you money. If I go to the NYTA office, I need a hundred thousand, as in now. I don't want to go for three weeks so as to I can be able to be assisted. I think that's how I can try to best answer. Marcus, the youth leader. Okay, no, thank you very much, uh, Deboho. At home, you can use TNA, uh, I beg your pardon, hashtag TNA Bizbrief, you know, to be part of the discussions that we're having this morning. Let me just bring you in here, uh, Ndate Mazibuku. You've been listening to what the young people are saying. Maybe you would want to sum up everything. Um, <coughs> I need to comment first on the notion that Afrikaans is being imposed on students. I think the, the uh, MEC has dealt with that. But the broader, uh, I think, misconception is about what Bantu education was. Bantu education was not about Afrikaans. Bantu education was not about the schools being separate. Bantu education was about a whole complex of all these things involved. It was about the money mentioned. It was about resources which were extremely poor. It was about young people who were alienated from <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been very cold in that I, I understand. That. <coughs> okay, you know what? Just take a glass of water. In the meantime, we do know that Hector Peterson's mother is in the hall this morning. You know, I, I would just like to get her view 40 years later. How does, you know, she feel about the whole thing that happened back in 1976? Can we just get the microphone to uh, Mum Peterson? Okay, there we have it. <coughs> Gosh. I don't think I should have covered them. Yes. What's this 40 years later after the events of 1976? Okay, I think we need to sort out Uman Peterson's microphone because it doesn't sound well. <coughs> Okay, we're sorting out. Okay, ma'am. Nga kubek. Nye jawulele uguti namshanje abante ii zugula na zetu zi funda nga history. Nise ikolwe ni abantua na wafunda nga yu. Iyo lentu yengi jawulele nga kudu. Okay. Mwa natli sake sa funda. Lentu yenza gelele. Yenza gelele nge ngalo soskati si funda iskolo. Kwe kwa sa funda nge history yaga 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 Okay, so nje ujabuli lo guti ange ko jan fan ribek any more at schools. Manje bafunda nge hekta pita sana na ame heroes. Iti chomba i history ange ti manje amandua na maifun. Okay, but how do you feel 40 years tomorrow? Njabuli ga kulu mina. Buona guti bakona abantu aba ibona ele nto e nzagele. Eskate si te ganga bazeba. Figure this cut. Mm, mm, mm. But then your take on the young people, do you think they really living to what Hector would have wanted to see? E you see a manje if I know good tea years lay history. Moreover, Elsa Salagubu Nabo Bakule and Gutibas, good to Gwenza Gelin in seventy six. I good to bar, but Salibangas, good to Gwenza Galan. 
Oh, okay. Okay. okay, Mama's born. Yeah, yeah, well. Thank you very much. That's Hector Peterson's Thank Maluman you. Peterson. Basically saying that, you know, what uh, makes a happy most is the fact that now uh, history is being, the history that's been taught at schools now is not, you know, the old history that we were taught, the Jan van Riebeek and them reaching the Cape, but it's history in uh, narrating the stories of how South <coughs> Africa attained freedom. Well, Ndate Mazibuko, are you fine now? Yeah. Okay, Ndate Galibu, you can go on. Now, <coughs> leaving that... Um, uh, comment about Bantu education. I'd like to come back to the question of what needs to be done to resolve the crisis in economic access by young people. That question, I think, is a consequence of lack of communication between the old and the new. The communication needs to happen in an open but disciplined manner. What happens usually is we avoid the, con uh, the, the, the communication right up to a point where the young people are angry. We avoid the communication up to a point where the old people are afraid to communicate with the young people. <laughs> because the bottled up anger <clears throat> is such that communication will not be rational. I think we need to break that impasse by allowing the communication to happen. There are a lot of things that old people cling to which are wrong and the young people need to challenge them. But there are also a lot of things which young people try to push through which are not necessarily correct. And the young people need to be challenged by the old people to say, for example, what you, you just said, that when I need money, I need it now. That concept is not a concept that builds society. There is no society which is instant coffee type. We need to work hard but how are we creating these opportunities? And how are we making the young people realize that they can access those opportunities of working hard? In my opinion, freedom means the right to be responsible, the right to work hard. It's not the right to engage in a friends you're feeding at the trough of economic access. It means the right to work hard to access economic well-being. It means as a young person going through the education and training that the country provides, and it means the adult world preparing the ground for the young people to take over from them in an orderly way. <coughs> and unless the communication is there, we will not have this happening in an orderly way. Okay, Dr. Mazibuk, I'm afraid Thank we're going to have to take a break. When we come back, uh, I'll bring you in. That this child, I'll also bring you, Antoinette, into the discussion station.